This is a production of the Boy Scouts of America. Welcome to Youth Protection Training. This program is designed for volunteer leaders and parents of boys in a Cub Scout or Boy Scout program. Now, child abuse is a significant social problem, harming not only the victims and their families, but also causing negative impacts on youth serving organizations and our communities. This training program focuses on BSA developed youth protection guidelines, the rules we follow to eliminate or reduce the opportunities for abuse to occur within a scouting program. These rules take into account the kinds of activities included in scouting and how these activities could present an opportunity for abuse. After completing the training, you should be able to demonstrate understanding of the BSA Youth Protection Guidelines by going online and correctly answering the questions to a short quiz. After passing the quiz, you'll receive a certificate of completion via email, evidence that you have completed BSA Youth Protection Training. Youth protection is an important part of planning for every scouting activity. Now we're dropping in on a meeting between the chartered organization representative, a new PAC committee member, and a brand new troop scoutmaster as they review plans for their summer programs. Guys, I saw your uh, activity plans and they look really good, especially for two people who are new to the program. I mean, you've got some great ideas in there. I think the kids are going to love it all. We're pretty excited ourselves. Oh, we're going to have such a good time. Absolutely. You know, the one thing we need to talk about, though, before we get too much further along is youth protection. Are you both familiar with it? Somewhat. I had to go through the whole criminal background check thing, and so did my other leaders. Yeah, right. I mean, all my Cub Scout day camp leaders had to do it, too. Yeah, well, background checks can only identify people who've been caught. So, obviously, for someone who's never been caught and has no record, background checks don't really offer us much protection. Well, yeah, but what are we supposed to do? Like, profiling? Uh, I would guess you can't tell a child abuser by how they look. Right. In most cases, they're actually ordinary-looking people, so we can't look for abusers. What we can look for are people who don't follow the rules, the rule breakers. What rules are we talking about here? The BSA has developed a set of youth protection guidelines that make it difficult for abusers to harm kids uh, when those rules are followed while kids are involved in scouting activities. How can we get a copy of these rules? Well, all the guidelines are in the Guide to Safe Scouting, and you can actually get it at a couple of different places. Uh, local scout shops carry it, or you can go online to scouting.org and just click on the Scouting Safety tab. So is that all we need to do? We get a guide to safe scouting and read over and follow the youth protection guidelines, and that's it? We're good to go? Pretty much. But you'll need to take the BSA's youth protection training. You know, it would probably be good for me to run through the guidelines with both of you to make sure your programs follow the guidelines. Actually, that is a good idea because I might have some questions. You know that word guidelines? It means sometimes things are open to interpretation. Exactly. So a key idea is adequate supervision. No surprise there, right? Well, no, but I mean, what does that mean? That we're over 18 or that we've passed the criminal background check? Actually, adequate supervision means at least two adults, with at least one of them over 21, are there for all scouting trips and outings, and at least one of them has to be a registered member of the BSA. And in order to get a tour permit, one of them must be youth protection trained. So that means like my wife and brother couldn't take a troop to a gaming arcade or a Habitat for Humanity build site or whatever. Right. It's called Too Deep Leadership and it helps protect adults as well as kids on trips and outings. Wait, how, how so? Well, on the youth protection side, if one adult tries something inappropriate with a scout, then the other adult can step in, stop it, and be a witness. On the flip side, having two adults means you're better protected against false accusations of abuse, since again, you have an adult witness. But in this case, they would help refute a false charge. And that's why they call it the too deep leadership? Yeah, exactly. But remember, too deep leadership is a minimum standard. You know, depending on the activity and the number of members, you might need more adult leaders. You know, I love that. It is so reassuring. I just feel like in today's world that the BSA has such a strong commitment to our kids' safety. Absolutely. Listen, you're really well protected, and so are the kids, as long as you follow the too deep leadership guidelines. By avoiding any one-on-one -on -one contact between a leader and a scout, you really reduce the opportunities for abuse to occur. And that's another really important guideline. You know, there should be no one-on-one -on -one contact between an adult leader and a scout that's not in full view of other adults or youths. Well, that sounds like a good idea in theory, but I can think of a lot of cases where you might end up alone with a scout. Like what? Well, let's say you finished a troop meeting and you're waiting for the last parent to show up and pick up their son, and your other leader couldn't stand until all the kids were gone. Good question. I'd say it really comes down to planning. If you know your other leader has to leave early, then 
You know, maybe recruit one of the other parents picking up their son to wait with you until that last boy is gone. But do it in advance so it's not an ambush and you don't get caught with no alternative but to be alone with that last boy. Well, yeah, but sometimes that's not always possible. Or even schedule parents to be there just to wait with you. you know, sometimes people are looking for ways to help out without becoming a leader, and this is a great way for them to get involved. Okay, what if one of my den leaders, they're dropping off the boys, but one of the den leaders lives way off, and it really doesn't make a lot of sense for them to be the last person dropped off? Sure, but, you know, we also have to follow the guidelines. You know, as long as there's another member present, you're meeting the no one-on-one -on -one contact guidelines. So, for example, you could have your registered Cub Scout son riding along with you, and that would meet the guideline. What about when you have to speak to a scout alone? Like, maybe there's a discipline problem or something. It's okay to speak to the scout alone, but you have to remain visible to the other leaders. So, you just move out of earshot and make sure that you can still be seen. What about merit badge counselors? Aren't they alone with scouts all the time? Well, they shouldn't be. Uh, the no one-on-one -on -one contact rule applies to merit badge sessions as well. In this case, the guidelines allow for a buddy system, where more than one scout can meet with a counselor at a time. Or you could have another adult around, the, uh, the counselor's spouse, or another leader, or the parent of a scout. That seems so over the top, having two adults around for a merit badge counseling session. Really? Why? Well, merit badge counselors are registered and have passed a criminal background check and are devoting their time to sharing their expertise with the scout to help them advance. It just seems so unlikely that they'd be abusers. That does seem unlikely. And then again, what better way for an abuser to gain access to a kid than to invite him into his home? Oh, come on. I mean, all you have to do is look at the headlines to see. You have no idea what people are really like. I mean, everybody these days has some secret. <laughs> yeah, that's true, but let's not get overly dramatic here. You know, the truth is the vast majority of adults involved in scouting are good people, like yourselves, doing it for the right reasons. You know, guys, we've been talking about adult behavior so far, but... Let's face it, sometimes problems can come from kids, you know, either through bullying or even sex abuse. How do we deal with that? Well, adult leaders are supposed to monitor their scouts and step in whenever necessary to stop inappropriate behavior. At that point, you should tell the boy's parents and get their help in dealing with it. Yeah, but what if you talk to the parents and that doesn't even help? If you've got serious or repetitive incidents going on, then the unit committee should review things. And if the problems continue, the scout can be asked to leave the unit or his membership can be revoked. Now, if that happens, the council should be notified immediately. Sounds like we're becoming judge and jury here. Look, I understand what you're saying, but the thinking is that that kind of behavior puts an unreasonable burden on the other kids and on the unit leadership, and it really can't be ignored. So the unit should also tell the scout executive about any incidents involving a physical injury or allegations of sexual misconduct by a youth member with another youth member. I so agree with that. I mean, the unit shouldn't have to put up with bad behavior. But what else do the guidelines say? Well, privacy is certainly an issue. You know, obviously, with outdoor activities and camping, there's a lot of clothing changes, showering, you know, the sort of thing where boys deserve privacy. So, in those cases, adult leaders should only step in if there's a safety or health problem. What about stopping horseplay, like snapping towels and stuff like that? Isn't that an invasion of privacy? Kids are going to be kids. I think you have to use your own judgment about a situation where, you know, it's just kids having a good time versus a health or safety issue, or even just their feelings being hurt. In cases like that, you need to step in and you need to stop the behavior. Wait, step in? How? Just take control, like you would at home. Privacy takes second place to safety. Since we're trying to create a positive experience, there are going to be times when you have to intervene and make sure everyone's feeling okay. But where is that line between, like, horseplay that's harmless or between, like, bullying and hazing? I'd say this. If you see any behavior that is questionable to you, then step in and stop it. Just be the responsible adult and err on the side of caution. Beyond that, the guidelines prohibit bullying or physical hazing and initiations. Well, this is certainly eye-opening, but, I mean, what else? Well, some things we can just kind of review here since they're all pretty much self-explanatory. Yeah, here. Um... Separate facilities should be maintained when camping, meaning no boy is permitted to sleep in the tent of an adult other than his own parent or guardian. When separate shower facilities are not available, specified separate times for use by male and female, as well as separate times for youth and adults should be scheduled and posted. Proper attire for all activities is required. For example, skinny dipping is not an appropriate part of scouting. No secret organizations are permitted. That's a good one. I know some people think the Order of the Arrow is a secret organization in scouting which just isn't true. Yeah, right. And every part of the scouting program is open to observation from parents and leaders. Okay, so last three things. First, constructive discipline. Uh, what they mean by that is discipline used in scouting should reflect scouting values and that corporal punishment is never permitted. Okay? okay. 
All right, item two. Adult leaders should monitor and guide the leadership techniques used by youth leaders, making sure BSA policies are followed. Basically, that means that DEN chiefs or other youth leaders can help lead a program, but they should never handle discipline issues. Okay? okay. And finally, activities with elements of risk, notably the high adventure stuff, should always be done with proper preparation, equipment, clothing, supervision, and safety measures. Wait a minute, what does that last one have to do with youth protection? Youth protection is more than preventing sexual abuse. You know, sometimes peer pressure or even bullying is used to get a member to do something that he may not want to do or even be capable of handling. You know what, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it feels like we get so involved with the sexual predator stuff, it feels like we forget about the other ways the kids need protection. Really, everything I've heard so far makes sense. And it's straightforward and easy to follow. It is. But we do need to talk about the hard part, which is what do you do when a guideline has been violated or... You have reason to believe a child has been abused. All right, but I want to get something to drink first. <laughs> Me too. Sure. <laughs> okay, let's take a break here for a bit of discussion amongst yourselves. Watch the following staged camping scenario. Then stop the video and take a few minutes to talk about what you should do in a situation like the one you're about to see. Assume you're the person in charge of the outing. When you're finished, restart the video and we'll cover what to do when a guideline is violated. Remember the guidelines regarding too deep leadership and no one-on-one -on -one contact. Just right down here. I saw a den of baby raccoons over there. You want to come check it out? Yeah, you go put up your mouth. Now we see a second violation of the guidelines by the same person. What would you do in this situation? Stop the video and take just a few minutes to discuss what action to take. Then restart the program when you're finished. In a situation where someone violates a guideline or attempts to violate a second time after it's been explained, that individual should be asked to leave the trip or outing and the incident reported to your scout executive. Now, let's rejoin our conversation and hear about guidelines related to peer-to-peer -peer sexual abuse or bullying. All set? You bet. Mm-hmm. That's the fun part, right? I know. But look, we'd all like to be able to think that we can protect our kids all the time and everywhere. But occasionally abuse happens. And let me just say that each of you should feel a responsibility to enforce the guidelines, correct and document rule violations, plus report the violations to the person in charge as well as the scout executive. If I found out one of my scouts had been abused, oh, I would be so furious. Yeah, my first inclination would be to go after the guy big time. That's perfectly understandable. But obviously that's not an option. You know, the first thing is to take steps to protect the child from any abuse, even if it happened outside of scouting. Okay, but how can we even tell that they're being abused, I mean, other than them just telling us? That's the hard part. You know, the best indicator is a child telling you someone hurt him or scared him or made him feel uncomfortable. And a lot of times kids don't tell anyone about it, but there might be physical signs or they start acting differently. So what are some of the signs? Physically, we're talking burns, bites broken bones or black eyes where the story just doesn't add up or the boy tells it a little differently each time. You know, another sign is bruises in various stages of healing. Well, that might come from being beat up multiple times. It's just a creepy conversation. Yeah, it's tough stuff. But would you rather be informed and know what to do or have it continue? Look, a couple of other signs would be refusing to go to a friend or relative's house for no apparent reason, saying stuff like, I just don't like him anymore or maybe acting out adult sexual behavior or using explicit language that a kid that age probably shouldn't know. That's all good to know, but what about the kid that doesn't have any visible signs of abuse? You said a minute ago they might start acting differently, not wanting to go to someone's house. What are some other signs? All abused kids are experiencing stress, and that can show in a lot of different ways. So you might see unhappiness, bedwetting, clinging or aggressive behavior, crying for no reason, the kid can't concentrate, changes in school performance. Self-inflicted injuries, suddenly acting withdrawn, things like that. Yeah, but I know of kids who are bedwetters, and I mean, I know for a fact they're not abused. Well, that brings up a good point. You know, there are a lot of things in a kid's life that can cause stress. Divorce, death, moving, school. You know, all those things can have the same effect, so you have to be sensitive to that. So, okay, the best indicator is a boy coming forward and telling you what's going on. What if he's lying? That doesn't happen very often, and in any case, it's something trained investigators deal with. But it would be horrible to turn someone in and then find out they were innocent. Yeah, that's true. 
Look, it's very difficult to report someone as a possible child molester, especially if you know them well or think you do. Look, it comes down to what you see and what you hear. If someone violates the guidelines or a boy comes forward or shows some of these indicators we've talked about, you should report it. How? If it's in the scouting program, you need to call the scout executive immediately and he or she will alert the authorities. And there may be times when you can't reach the scout executive and you have to call yourself. If you're aware of something outside of scouting, you should still call Child Protective Services or the police. So what happens to the person you've turned in? The guidelines say alleged abusers are out of the program, at least until the allegations are resolved. But who's going to handle that? I mean, who's going to get them removed from the program? Well, the scout executive will take care of it. That's why you have to report all abuse accusations within the scouting program to the scout executive, so the problem can be addressed immediately. Let's take a break here for another discussion regarding a possible youth protection situation. Watch the upcoming stage scenario. Then stop the program and take a few minutes to discuss what action you would take if you witnessed the situation. Remember the guidelines about privacy and consider how easy it is to put pictures on the internet. What would you do in this situation? Stop the video and take just a few minutes to discuss what action to take. Then restart the program when you're finished. Taking pictures of people in bathrooms or showering is clearly a violation of the privacy guideline. In this case, the recommended action would be to immediately confiscate the cell phone, delete any inappropriate photos, and discipline the scout. Swift action is necessary because of the ability to post digital images on the Internet instantaneously. In addition, the action should be reported to the boy's parents and their help solicited in preventing future such behavior. Okay, let's return now to our discussion and pick back up with what to do about accusations. Well, what are we supposed to do if a boy comes to us with an accusation? I mean, how are we supposed to handle that? The most important thing is to listen without questioning him. I mean, he's only going to tell you as much as he wants, so you have to be kind of neutrally supportive. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> Staring him blankly? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. You could say things like, that should never happen to anyone, or I wouldn't want that to happen to me but you don't want to make any excuses for the abuser like I'm sure you didn't mean to. Look, secrecy is a big weapon for the abuser and they tell their victims that they won't be believed if they tell someone what happened to them. So if you act like you don't believe the kid, you're only helping the abuser's case. You say don't question the child. Okay, I get that, but are there other things that we should know about how to handle this? You cannot promise to keep the information secret. You have to report any allegations of sexual abuse to the authorities immediately. Now that's according to many state laws and BSA poly. If it's in the scouting program, you should report it to the scout executive immediately. Again, if he or she's not available, report it yourself to the proper authorities. I'm telling you, I would have a hard time not going right after the guy. I think we all feel that way. But it's important you don't get angry in front of the boy because he might interpret that as you being mad at him. It, it's already taking a lot of courage and trust for him to come forward. Okay, so if we see signs of abuse and we witness it firsthand, or of course if the boy tells us about it, we report it to the scout executive immediately. If it happens within the scouting program, yes. Or report it yourself to the authorities if the scout executive isn't around. Right. And if it happens outside the program, we need to tell Child Protective Services or the police. Right. I'm confused on one point. What's that? Earlier we talked about physical abuse like bruising or broken bones. Are those really signs of sexual abuse? They could be, but typically those are more about physical abuse. In fact, you're making a good point. We've mostly been talking about sexual abuse, but there's also physical and emotional abuse or neglect. You know, often kids suffer from more than one kind of abuse. What about those? Are they part of these youth protection guidelines? Absolutely. Physical abuse and neglect are things you should report to the scout executives or police. You know, neglect is a little tricky, though. If it's obvious the kid is skinnier than a coat hanger and not properly dressed for the season and eats everything in sight when he's around you, and tells you he never gets fed at home. Well, you might want to take that up with the scout executive and see what can be done. But look, the effects of poverty and neglect can be similar. Bottom line, if you see the basic needs like food, clothing, shelter, not being met, you should report it. What about emotional abuse? In those cases, it's up to us to continue to make scouting a positive experience for the boys. You know, things like no bullying or mean nicknames, treat each other with respect, 
follow the scout oath and the scout law, all those things will help any boys dealing with emotional abuse. But it's not reportable. Well, actually it is. If a boy comes to you and makes suicidal or self-demeaning remarks, then that's a clear sign he needs help and it should be reported. You know, reporting isn't negative. It's just trying to facilitate help for the kid. What do we do if we want some more information about all this? Well, all BSA Youth Protection resources are listed in the Youth Protection section of www.scouting.org. And the BSA has some great video-based awareness training materials for youth members, too. Uh, for Cub Scouts, there's It Happened to Me, which covers the four basic rules for personal safety. For Boy Scouts, there's A Time to Tell, which is built around the three R's of youth protection, recognize, resist, and report. And for older scouts and venturers, there's Personal Safety Awareness which has material more appropriate for teenagers. We think it's a good idea for every unit to watch these programs once a year with their parents present so they can discuss the subject with their boys. You know, that is such a good idea. We really need to do that. Yeah, and while the whole subject makes my skin crawl, I feel better knowing what to do and what to look for if I see or hear it. Well, good. I mean, that's pretty much it as far as guidelines and reporting. You guys have any questions? No, I'm good. Do Me too. All right, so now back to the real stuff. Where are you, where are you guys going next weekend? Okay, I'm, wait, where are you going? Child abuse is a difficult topic for people to discuss, but unfortunately, it happens. As a leader or volunteer, you are relied on to do your part in keeping scouting safe for the boys. So thank you for watching and for all that you do. To complete this module, browse online to scouting.org and select My Scouting. You'll be prompted to log in to your My Scouting account or create an account. Once logged in, select e-learning from the menu and then click on Take Youth Protection Quiz.